All right, last we've been talking about how with the collapse of the Roman Empire, there are different cultures on, on the ruins of what had been the Roman Empire. So we talked about the Byzantine civilization, uh, and we started to talk about Islam. And uh, there was also the various Germanic kingdoms, especially the Franks, that emerged in Western Europe. And today we're going to finish up discussing about Islam and the Arabs and their civilization. And we're going to move on and talk about Western Europe and uh, the Germanic kingdoms and the Franks in particular. All right. Now, when we last finished talking about Islam, we talked about how the Umayyad Caliphate had been established after they had that brief civil war. The Umayyad Caliphs ruled from Damascus and uh, during the course of the 7th century the expansion of Islam continued with the conquest of uh, North Africa and the conversion of the peoples of North Africa like the Moors and the Berbers to, to Islam these tribal areas, tribal peoples and, and then the expansion further into Spain by 711 Spain had been uh, conquered by uh, Arabs and Moors now working together under the leadership of the of the Moors. Now, around the, the middle of the eighth century, though, there was a change in dynasty. Um, the Umayyad Caliphate was based on the idea that the Umayyads, they were a clan, a family, were the ruling caliphs, the leaders of Islam. Remember, a caliph it means successor, the successors of the Prophet Muhammad. So the caliph is both the secular and the religious leader of, of Islam. Now, many Arabs did not think that the Umayyad family, they were a leading family from the city of Mecca, that they should be the, the caliphs, caliphs. Now, Abu Abbas, uh, a man by the name of Abu Abbas, belonged to a clan, the same clan that the Prophet Muhammad belonged to. Remember, the Arabs were a tribal people, they were organized by families and clans, and some, some people believe that, that the true caliphs should be people from the clan or from the family of the Prophet Muhammad. Now, Abu Abbas was of that clan, of that family, and uh, he drew support from a lot of Arabs who had settled in Iraq. Uh, large numbers of Arabs had settled in especially southern Iraq, and Abu Abbas had the support of these Arabs, and uh, he staged an uprising against the Umayyads and defeated them and was recognized as the new caliph. Um, and one of the first things he did was to move the capital the, from Damascus in Syria. He moved it to Iraq. He built a whole new city. Baghdad was built by the Abbasids. The Abbasids being the family that was started by Abu Abbas. And uh, Baghdad became the capital of the new the new capital of the of the empire, and he moved it. One reason he moved it to Baghdad was located near the ancient city of Babylon, and he so it was a very strategic location where the Tigris and Euphrates rivers are very close, very wealthy region, and uh, also a lot of the political support for his dynasty came from Iraq, came from that part of the Arab world. Now, during this period, you see continued expansion. And this time, the expansion, instead of moving toward the west, that had been the tendency during the Umayyad Caliphs, uh, the Abbasid Caliphs, their expansion moved east. And we see Arab armies expanding deep, deep into Central Asia, into places uh, like uh, um, Uzbekistan and uh, Kazakhstan, and all those stands in Central Asia, uh, across the steppes. And um, this was an area where they found a competitive empire, the Chinese. The Chinese, under the Tang Dynasty, we'll talk about them later, the Chinese were also expanding into Central Asia with their empire. And uh, you have a clash of empires. In 751, you had the Battle of Talis, which was fought what is in today and what is Tajikistan in Central Asia. And it was one of the more important battles in history because it was, a, it was a big victory for the Arabs. The Chinese were defeated. They were forced to withdraw. And uh, as a result of this victory, Islam was able to expand 
deep into Central Asia. So the various Turkish tribes, who up to this point had been pagan, had worshipped different gods and had been heathens, at this point the Turkish tribes in mass converted to Islam. So this this was a, a big victory. Now, the, the significance of this victory is, is seen further in the sense that it would be Central Asian Turkish tribes who would expand Islam into India, and from India it would expand into Central Asia. So this victory in 751 AD set the stage for the expansion of Islam eventually, centuries down the road, into the Indian subcontinent and further into Southeast Asia. You know, it's the, the, the largest Muslim country in the world is actually Indonesia in uh, Southeast Asia. And this is all, the, the stage was set by the, big, the, the great victory of the uh, Arabs at Talis over the Chinese. <clears throat> now, the, uh, probably the greatest and most distinguished of all the Abbasid rulers of the House of Abbas, Abu Abbas, was Harun al-Rashid. You see his dates up there. And under this, this caliph, the, the Abbasid Empire stretched from North Africa, from the Atlantic, deep, deep into Central Asia. So it was a, a massive empire. And Baghdad, the capital of this empire, uh, became a city of, uh, some people, so according to some estimates, it had, may have been, had a population as many as one million people. Um, the, the, uh, the, the, you got to remember, one thing you have to remember is that the, uh, the, the canal and irrigation system of Mesopotamia that had been around for, for centuries, going back to ancient Sumer, that, that system was fully developed. So you had a, a very wealthy uh, agricultural area in especially southern Iraq that could support a very, very large population much larger than even today. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, now this uh, Harun al-Rashid, uh, another reason why he's famous in history was that uh, it was during his reign that the famous Arabian Nights were, were uh, put together. The, you know, you've heard of the tales of the Arabian Nights. These were uh, folk tales told by the Arabs. You know, probably the most famous one is Ali Baba and the, and the Forty Thieves and uh, Aladdin's Lamp. You know, you know, Aladdin, the genie, and all that, maybe made famous by Disney, uh, <laughs> maybe perverted by Disney, but but uh, but these are all tales. These are all Arab folklore that were uh, first actually collected and put together during the reign of Harun Al Rashid. And in the stories of the Arabian Nights, he's the one of the the characters in the in the story, the the collection that was eventually put together. <coughs> now. The, uh, the, the reign of Harun al-Rashid really marks the end of an era because it was after his death that the Abbasid Empire began to break up. One thing you have to remember about this empire was it was so huge. And initially what held it together was the fact that you had Arabs uh, who had conquered this empire who, when they, the empire first existed, formed the ruling elite. But, you see, what happened over the course of generations is that these Arabs sunk roots into the local area. And they intermarried, like in Iran, they intermarried with Iranians. Uh, and where, when they settled in Egypt, they, they settled down in the region, established local roots. Same was true in North Africa. Same was true in Spain. So, over time, the loyalty of these people, the loyalty of the Arabs spread out over such a large area, that loyalty to the central government weakened. And so it wasn't long before you began to see local governors um, kind of taking over and becoming more independent and autonomous. Now, these, when local governors became autonomous and took over, they, they never rejected the spiritual authority of the caliph. They called themselves emir. Um, emir just is an Arab, it means, means chieftain or warrior or general. General would be, probably be a good... A good uh, Translation. So these emirs, they, they established their own dynasties in parts of the former Abbasid Empire. And so they still recognized the caliph as the, as the, uh, the, the great ruler. Uh, 
and as the spiritual leader of Islam, but they ruled local affairs. Now, the, uh, the problem with the, Ab the Abbasid dynasty was that it became weaker uh, because what happened over time was that uh, the caliphs, the, the court of the caliph in Baghdad became more and more divided. Um, uh, what happened is that over time, the, the caliphs uh, became, well, they became more and more to depend upon uh, Iranians and Turks uh, from Central Asia to be their soldiers and their, uh, their deputies. They didn't trust the local Arabs. So they would bring in uh, uh, allies and from you know, Turks and Iranians and bring them in as their uh, ministers and as their bodyguard, as their military uh, soldiers. And uh, sometimes this would result in uh, problems, in, in conflict between the Arab population in Baghdad and these soldiers and administrators brought in by the caliphs to be their officials and their soldiers. And it, sometimes it got so bad that caliphs had to leave Baghdad and move north and establish their court somewhere else because the local population was so hostile. Um, also, a lot of the later caliphs, by the time you get to the 9th and into the 10th century, uh, many of them became more interested in building palaces and governing the local area rather than the empire as a whole. So they became more localized over time. So the caliphate became weaker and weaker by the time you get to the uh, 9th and especially the 10th century. And that was one reason why when we talked about Byzantium, they, they got a, a reprieve, so to speak, in Byzantium from a constant Arab attacks because with this uh, decline of the Abbasid Caliphate, there was a decline in the jihads that were fought, the, you know, the wars of expansion. And that really was a, a nice break for the Byzantine Empire, allowed them to have a resurgence in the 9th and 10th centuries. But uh, another problem for the empire was that, or for the caliphate, was that by the time you get to the, the 9th and 10th centuries, in the 10th century in particular, there were there was challenges to the leadership of the caliph in Baghdad, the Abbasid caliph. Um, in around 890 AD, a man by the name of Muhammad al-Habib, somehow he had convinced himself, or he had convinced, he was able to convince others that he was the direct descendant of the Prophet Muhammad. He was, he claimed to be descended from uh, Ali and Fatima. The number Fatima was the, the only child of the Prophet Muhammad. And he was able to convince in what is today Libya, he was able to convince the, the Libyans, the Arabs and the Libyans in, in Libya, that he was the true caliph as a direct descendant of the Prophet Muhammad, and he was able to seize power. And eventually, he, uh, he was able to conquer Egypt and make it his own. And this, under his reign, under, not under his reign, but under the reign of his successors, they were known as the Fatimids. The, they were called the Fatimids because they claimed to be descended from Fatima, the daughter of the Prophet Muhammad. And they, established, they claimed to be the true caliphs, and they established Cairo in Egypt as their capital. So by the time you get to the 10th century, you had two caliphs, both claiming to be the true caliph. So you had one caliph in Baghdad, you had another caliph, the Fatimid caliph in, in Cairo, in Egypt. Uh, but it uh, wasn't too long before you had a third caliph. Um, what had happened is when the Abu Abbas and the Abbasids came to power in Baghdad, some of the Umayyad caliphs, some of the Umayyad family, they fled and established themselves in Spain, of all places, in Spain. And uh, they ruled over Spain. And uh, under their leadership, Spain flourished and became very prosperous. Andalusia, as it was called, by the Arabs. So you had a Moorish and Arab population living in Spain. Uh, and they built Cordoba, or Cordoba, you can spell it with a B or a B, Cordoba as their capital. By, by about 1030, the, court, the rulers of Cordoba claimed that they were the true caliphs. So by 1030 AD, you had three caliphs, not just one, three caliphs, each claiming to be the true successor of the Prophet Muhammad. One in Baghdad, the Abbasid Caliph, the Fatimid Caliph, in Cairo, in Egypt, and now you have the, you had, you, I bet you didn't know that Spain was a capital of the 
of the caliphate, uh, you know, the Cordova was the one of the cap capitals of Islam, and the ruler, the Umayyad ruler, claimed to be the true caliph, the successor of the prophet in Spain. Now, um, <clears throat> now up to this point, up to this point in history, the Arabs, or people descended from Arabs, formed the ruling class in this empire, in the sense that uh, everywhere you went, uh, Arabs were the ones in charge. Now, they often intermarried with locals, and so they, they weren't all pure Arab blood, but they, Arab, Arabs were the dominant culture throughout this, this region, from, from Spain to North Africa, all the way to, to Iran and Central Asia. But uh, a big change occurred with the arrival of the Seljuk Turks. Now, we've already talked about the Turks because they were the ones who overcame the Byzantine Empire, the Battle of Manzikir. The Seljuk <coughs> Turks were, their Seljuk is a dynastic name, the, the house of, of uh, Seljuk. They were sultans. A sultan is a Turkish warlord or Turkish king. And uh, the Seljuk was a family of, of sultans. And uh, they were able to amass in what is today Central Asia, in that same area we talked about earlier, <coughs> they were able to amass a lot of power. Now, Turks had been used for a long time, before this time, as mercenaries <coughs> and as uh, warriors in Arab armies. <coughs> but the Seljuk sultans, they didn't want to be just mercenaries. They didn't want to just be officials of Arab rulers. They wanted to be the rulers. And uh, beginning in around the uh, beginning of the 11th century, the Seljuk Turks expanded westward. They moved from Central Asia. They were great horsemen. Uh, great, they could they, they put together large armies. They would, they united various Turkish tribes under the under the Seljuk Sultan. And uh, in 1055, they captured Baghdad and they took the city. Now, what the Seljuk Turks did though was that they um, when they took over. They still recognized the caliph as the spiritual ruler, but they were the political rulers and the military rulers. And uh, the Celtic Turks were able to conquer almost all of the Near East. They, 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 we already discussed how they defeated the Byzantine army at Vansikir. They also uh, conquered Syria and Palestine and uh, Iran, Iran and all those areas came under their control. Um, but it wasn't long before the Seljuk Empire broke up because what, you know, you've got to remember about the Seljuk Turks was that it was a collection of, Sur of, of Turkish tribes that came together under the leadership of one sultan. And what happened over time would be that vi these various, this coalition of Turkish tribes kind of broke up each under its own sultan. So the Seljuk Empire didn't last that long. But the significance of the arrival of the Seljuk Turks was that even though the Seljuk Empire per se did not last very long, maybe a couple of generations before it broke up. What happened was that the Turks continued to be the rulers of much of the Middle East. So in the sense that the, the dynasties that came after, the, the states that arose in the Middle East after the arrival of the Seljuk Turks were all ruled by Turks or people of Turkish ancestry. And Arabs became basically, well, politically second class citizens in the sense that they were no longer at the forming states and ruling as rulers. Instead you had Turkish sultans ruling over Arab peoples. Now the thing about the Turks was that they were Muslims and they had profound respect for Arab culture. You know, the language of the Quran was Arabic. So these Seljuk Turks had a lot of respect for Arabs. And at the, local le at the local level, Arabs continued to run local affairs, even when the empires were ruled by uh, people of Turkish ancestry. So the, uh, uh, actually, Turks continued to dominate, or Turkish people continued to dominate the Middle East all the way up until World War I. It wasn't until after the collapse of the Ottoman Empire uh, with, the, with, the, with World War I that, that Arabs started to actually rule over Arabs. Uh, because for, for uh, almost a thousand years, Arabs were dominated by various Turkish peoples or, and Turkish rulers. <coughs> Many people have, have, uh, have seen the relationship between Turks and Arabs as much 
similar to the relationship between the Romans and the Greeks in the sense that the Turks took great pride in their military achievements and being rulers and governors and lawgivers, just like the Romans did, but looked to, looked to the Arabs for culture in the same way that the Romans looked to the Greeks for culture and for high culture and for theology and great literature and art. <coughs> All right, so that would be a nice segue into our next subject, which is talking a little bit about Arabic civilization. Um, now, a couple things to remember about Arabic. When we think of Arabs, we often think of, you know, the popular image is the, the Bedouin, you know, the living in tents, having their camels, uh, living in the desert, you know. But the fact of the matter is, is that Arabic civilization was very much urban-based. Just in many ways, it was more urban-based than any other of the successor states to the Roman Empire. The, the center of civilization in Islam and, and the Arabic states was the city. And there were a number of great cities that, that came to be. One of the things we see happening with the Arab expansion, often as the Arabs expanded, they founded new cities. Like Cairo was founded when the Arabs took over Egypt, they founded Cairo as, their, as, as a new city. Uh, and uh, Baghdad, we've already seen, was founded as a new Arab Muslim city when, it, when the Abbasid dynasty came into power. Um, Damascus was an ancient city, but it, it rose to prominence as one of the capitals of the caliphate during the Umayyad caliphate. Uh, we talked about Cordova or Cordova already. Uh, Tunis, which, which gives its name to Tunisia today, North Africa. Tunis was built by Arabs when they conquered North Africa, and the site of Carthage was abandoned. And Tunis is actually located very close to the ancient site of Carthage. Now these cities were centers of trade and culture. And uh, one of the things we see happening is with the expansion of Arabic civilization, trade flourished. Uh, there are a couple of reasons for this. One reason being uh, common language. Uh, even, even in areas where Arabic was not, did not become the predominant language, like in parts of Egypt or uh, North Africa or especially in Iran, Arabic could still be spoken and understood because it was the language of the Quran. If you converted to Islam, you had to read the Quran in Arabic. So Arabic became, was, a, was a language that could be spoken anywhere by any Muslim. So it acted as a nice vehicle really at, for, for commerce. It really facilitated commerce. Another thing about Arabic civilization was that it, the Arabic civilization was never um, hostile toward trade. Remember, uh, Muhammad himself, before he became the prophet, had been a camel driver, had been a trader, had been a merchant. So making money through trade was not a demeaning profession like it was in China or how it was viewed by many European aristocrats. But it was viewed as, as an honorable profession. So trade just flourished. And all you had this network of trade that linked the Mediterranean to Central Asia during this period. Um, another really advantage for the Arabs was that they adopted Hindu numerals. Remember, our numeral system is called Arabic numerals. You know, the 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. But it was actually invented in India. But the Arabs adopted it and used it. And uh, it, was a gr it, it did great for commerce and trade because you can long divide and long, do long, multi long multiplication and long division with Arabic numerals that you can't do with any other numer numerical system because it doesn't have the zero. I mean, that it was, you know, the zero, you know, here there's a great joke, you know, they, they went to the inventor of the zero and said, hey, so you invented the zero, what do you got? No! <laughs> but anyway, so, uh, but anyway, so but the Arabic numerals, can you see how that, being able to add, subtract, and divide, how, you know, how that would be something that would benefit commerce? Because you could do a lot of accounting. You know, what do you think accounting is? Anybody, any accounting majors here? It's all about numbers, right? It's all about adding and subtracting, dividing, knowing all the numbers. And Arabic numerals did great for that. Um, one of the things that Arabs did is they invented our modern system of credit. Um, the word check is from an Arabic word. You know where you, you, get, you write a check and cash it? The Arabs did that because with Arabic numerals, they had an accounting system that would work so they could keep track of High account, so you could uh, you could write a, an Arab could write a check in Damascus, go to Egypt and cash it in Egypt on a bank there. So you had this system of banks and trade that was very far flung throughout the Arab world, and the systems of credit that would eventually be adopted by Europeans. 
Uh, so so uh, a lot of the advances in math, mass, you know, long division, what do you call it when you do like 20 times 17? What is that called? Not simple multiplication, but any math people here? Anyway. <laughs> but you, you can't do that without the zero. I mean, it's, a, it's, it's very difficult. You can do it. It's just difficult. So, so the, the tremendous advances in math were made by the Arabs because they had Arabic numerals. And they you pr applied it in a practical way to developing systems of accounting and credit systems to advance trade. And that's why trade has flourished within these, these Arabic states. Um, now, another thing about Arab cities was that uh, uh, everybody noticed that they were always cleaner and nicer than any city in Europe during the time because, um, because of the Muslim belief in charity as one of your obligations. Uh, every city usually had uh, free hospitals, uh, they had uh, baths, and they had hotels for travelers because these were all, you know, hospitality and cleanliness were very important to, uh, in, you know, it's in the Quran, you know, you got, you know, washing yourself, being pure, uh, you know, and, and, and being charitable. So, so wealthy people, merchants who made money in trade, were always very generous in, in giving out, building hospitals for the poor, uh, building baths to keep people clean and ritually pure. Uh, public baths were everywhere in every major city. Um, and uh, of course, every major city had one or more mosques or places of worship. So uh, mosques and hospitals and hotels for travelers and baths, these were all the landmarks that one would find in the great cities of the, of the Muslim world. Now, another uh, aspect of the uh, Islam is the great advances that they made in learning. Um, the, uh, the mosque was a place of worship, but every mosque usually had a school, a madrasa, a school, because everybody had to learn, if you were, especially if you were non-Arab, you had to learn Arabic so you could read the Quran. But remember, in, the, in Islam, you can only read the Quran really in Arabic alone, because God speaks Arabic, of course. Everybody knows that. So, so you had all these schools. Now, some of these schools became, in some of the bigger cities, these schools built around mosques became centers of learning and scholarship because one of the subjects that I had to study was law. You had to study law. Uh, because remember, in, in Islamic society, um, the, uh, the, the lawyers, people who studied Sharia law, they were the, the closest thing to a clergy or a, or a ministry that you had in Islam. In fact, uh, esteemed lawyers would often be asked to give the sermon at the mosque on Friday. But, but lawyers, you know, people would go travel from, from, to these great schools, these great places to learn the law. Now, Another development we see happening is that many of the works by Greek uh, geographers, Greek uh, physicians, Greek philosophers like Plato, these works were translated into Arabic and studied. So um, not only did you, could you study the law at one of these schools, you could also study medicine, and you could also study um, theology, philosophy. Now for, for Muslims, Philosophy and theology were one of the same, and uh, what what the uh, what these Arab thinkers began to do was to come to, to try to uh, show that Greek philosophy and Arab theology were in union with one another. So they they often used Greek philosophy to understand and expound on Islamic theology, and uh, this effort to try to show how revelation, how the word of God through the Quran could be in accordance and in harmony with Greek philosophy, this, this is often called um, scholasticism. And these efforts to try to show the harmony between faith and reason, this would be something that would be taken on by European philosophers in the Middle Ages. But they got the idea from Arabic scholars. Now, uh, another thing that uh, these Arabic scholars did was that they, they were intrigued by Greek philosophy and how, and how Greek philosophers had tried to show that 
uh, understanding mathematics was a way of understanding God, that God was a mathematician. That you could, if you understand, if you understood the nature of mathematics and numbers, you would have an understanding of the cosmos and, and God himself. So many of these, um, these uh, Arab theologians were also very distinguished mathematicians. Uh, one of the most, more famous, of all the most famous uh, Arab theologian and mathematician of all was Avin Senna. Now that's his, what he was known to by Christian scholars because in the Middle Ages, this guy became a big influence on Christian theologian, theologians and Christian philosophers in Europe. But Avin Senna, uh, he, lived, he lived in Baghdad, being one of the great cities of the, of the, of the Arab world, had a great, was a great center of learning. And he, uh, Avin Senna, lived in Baghdad about 1000 AD and probably his, one of his greatest inventions was he invented algebra. Algebra was invented by, I mean, you can't really have algebra unless you have Arabic numerals, but algebra was invented by, uh, by Arabs. It was freaking big. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Avin Senna is usually credited with being one of the discoverers of, or inventors or discoverers of, of algebra. But, uh, but the, the idea that you could uh, go to a single school and study a variety of different subjects, whether it be law or theology, philosophy, mathematics, um, as well as uh, medicine. That, that idea was born in the Arab world. And then later on, when Europeans had contact with the Arabs, they, they had that same idea, but they called it a university. So the university was actually invented by the Arabs and adopted and adapted by Europeans. So when the first universities in Europe were built around cathedrals and churches and were modeled after the schools that the Arabs founded around mosques. <coughs> so uh, now uh, another, another strand of Islam that we see, uh, another aspect of Islam besides this interest in philosophy and in reason was there was also a mystical element to it in the sense that it wasn't just all about trying to show how reason and revelation were in harmony. Some, some Muslim thinkers became very mystical. M many people have, 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 seen, have speculated that perhaps as they advanced into Central Asia and made contact with Buddhism, that many of them, might, that might have been an influence. But, uh, that, but in, um, in, in Islam, this kind of mysticism where you try to kind of unite with God and you know, have this kind of, you know how Buddhists wanted to become one with the cosmos and nirvana uh, for, for Muslim thinkers there's this idea that you could, you could kind of blend with God, you could become one with Allah and have this kind of mystical experience where you were like became divine and it was called Sufism, a Sufi was a, a mystic who was someone who was believed to have actually like united with God and, and, and therefore was a, his person was holy. And in many parts of the Muslim world, when a Sufi died, a, a person who was considered to be someone who was a, a, a saint and someone who had experienced union with God, people would come for miles and miles around to, to visit the burial place of a Sufi saint. Sometimes they're sometimes called saints, borrowing from the Roman Catholic tradition because these, these Sufi saints, so to speak, were considered to be sacred persons. Now, um, today, in today's world, though, many Al Qaeda are 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 kind of puritanical about Sufi saints and <coughs> honoring Sufi saints as uh, an offense and blasphemy against the Quran because it's not in the Quran. Um, it's not so. You, you a lot of times you hear about Al Qaeda uh, extremists. Uh, destroying the, the sites of Sufi saints, you know, destroying their tombs, because they consider uh, in Africa, we're going to get to Africa in a minute and there were these Sufi saints in, uh, in what is today uh, Timbuktu and, and Mali, and uh, when the Al-Qaeda took over, they, they vandalized all these beautiful tombs that were, had been built uh, in honor of these, these Sufi saints in, uh, in Central Africa <coughs> anyway, so that's uh, in a nutshell, that's the uh, Arabic Civilization. Now, I just touched on uh, Africa here. Uh, one of the things about Islam is that it, uh, it, it, its influence expanded well beyond 
okay, even the confines of the Umayyad and Abbasid caliphates. And we see, we see Islam expanding deep into Africa, and we already discussed, and we'll discuss how advanced into India and eventually made its way to Southeast Asia. But, but I want to talk a little bit about Africa. We haven't really talked about, we've talked about parts of Africa, but not about the whole continent. So, but the introduction of Islam to Africa had a big impact on the history of that, of that particular continent. So uh, real quickly here, um, one thing you have to remember about Africa is that it's, uh, this map works, there we go. Now one thing you have to remember about Africa is that it's uh, very diverse in terms of its geography and, and uh, topography. You know, we've already talked a lot about North Africa. North Africa, uh, this strip of territory along the coast here, has a climate very much like the other coasts of the Mediterranean. So mild winters, hot summers, and the people of North Africa have typically been Caucasian, you know, very olive complexion. You know, if, if if you got somebody from Tunisia, somebody from Sicily, and somebody from Syria, and put them all in the same room, you wouldn't be able to tell one from the other. They all pretty much look the same. You know, the dark eyes, olive complexion, dark hair. They're all probably genetic. I think that somebody pointed out they all are genetically related to one another. But, but then what you see in Africa is this huge area right here, uh, just south of the coast, where you have the Sahara Desert. Very hot, very dry, very desolate. And this Sahara Desert, has always kind of separated the rest of Af this this northern tip of Africa from the rest of Africa, and and so typically south of the Sahara you get African peoples, uh, dark-skinned peoples, uh, and uh, and there and this area this part of Africa has always been uh, because of the vast amount of, of desert has always been re relatively isolated from the rest. Of Africa, so but when you, once you get past that hot, dry desert, the Sahara Desert, you get to uh, this area right here that is called savanna, and it's kind of a tropical grassland that that can support good populations. And then when you get into the heart of Africa, the real central part of Africa, you hit rainforest. So you hit, so think of it this way: you have the the coast desert, then you have savanna, tropical grassland. In the middle of Africa, you have rainforest, and then southern, the southern part of Africa is like a mirror image of the northern part of Africa. So, after you, when you, as you proceed, you find more, uh, more grassland, more desert, and then South Africa, the extreme part of South Africa, has a climate just like extreme North Africa. That's why you, a lot of the great surfing champions come from South Africa <laughs> because. It's, they have a climate just like Southern California. Uh, <clears throat> that's why it's a, a, a tourist destination. All right, so that, in that nutshell, is like what Africa looks like. Now, um, what we see happening is that... Uh, uh, oh, jeez, I lost it. wonder what happened. All right, hold on. We'll take a break now while I figure out what happened. All right, so let's talk about, uh, finish talking about Islam in Africa. Now, I want to give a little background about Africa. And when I talk about Africa, we're talking about the, the, the part, the, what's sometimes called South. All right, so let's talk about, uh, finish talking about Islam in Africa. Now, I want to give a little background about Africa. And when I talk about Africa, we're talking about the, the, the part, the, what's sometimes called Sub-Saharan Africa, the area south of the, the Great Sahara Desert. And uh, now this, this area has been... Uh, uh, the agricultural revolution occurred very early, as early as any other part of the world. By about, we know that from around 6,000 BC that they were already uh, domesticating millet, which is a type of grain, and, and sorghum. Ever had sorghum before? It's like a sugar cane. Mm -hmm. But uh, sorghum and millet were being had to, were domesticated and being raised in the, the tropical grasslands of Africa by about 6,000 BC. Um, uh, the further south, when you get into... Uh, the rainforest in, of Central Africa, they, they were, uh, the main crop that you can grow there is the sweet potato or yam. You know, in, in Central Africa, they say, I am what I am. That's what I, I said. I, that's what I heard anyway. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's a joke. Not really. But anyway. Um, but, uh, you know, you are what you eat. I am what I am. Uh, 
Okay. But anyway, so now, but the thing is, sorry. The, the thing is about rainforests is that uh, up for a long time, people used to think that rainforests were could not support a large population. That you'd find in, pro in these isolated rainforests, you're more likely to find maybe people living more primitive as hunter gatherers. You know, more simple culture. Uh, but that's started to change in recent years, um, especially like they've discovered, like in the Amazon, they've discovered evidence of, of, of towns and cities that, that were once flourishing. Uh, and um, even in parts of Nigeria and Central Africa, in, in thick, heavy rainforests, they're finding evidence that there were, there were advanced cultures and civilizations living in these areas uh, and uh, building cities. And, and so, so uh, the rainforest, if used properly, you know, you, there was a way that people found a way to, to, to raise crops and, and to flourish in these very uh, uh, difficult terrains. Um, now, um, now, the earliest known s civilizations, that complex cultures that developed in sub-Saharan Africa, one would be the so-called Nok culture. Now, the Nok culture flourished uh, in what is today the, uh, the Niger River Valley. There's, there, there's, Africa has a number of great river systems, and one, of course, is the Nile, but there, you also have the, the Niger and the Congo. And you know, the Niger River gives its name to Nigeria, but uh, in the Niger River Valley of Central Africa, the Nok culture has been found. It's, it's, it's estimated to live about 400, about 400 BC or so. The only reason why this is considered to be a complex culture is the fact that they found these elaborate uh, terracotta masks uh, and, and, uh, and effigies, you know, uh, sculptures. And uh, the sophistication involved in these sculptures would seem to indicate a high degree of specialization. And uh, when you have that kind of high degree of specialization, you can kind of assume that other aspects of a complex culture, like uh, stratification and uh, some kind of government, were also in place. But the Nok culture, we don't know that much about it, but we do know that they, they created this beautiful, these beautiful sculptures. Um, another early sub-Saharan African civilization would be the civilization of Aksum. Now, Aksum was located in East Africa, uh, in what is today would be Ethiopia and Somalia. And uh, sometimes it's spelled A-X-U-M. Uh, you can see it either way, it's the same civilization. But uh, th there's, uh, there's, there's possibly some evidence of, a, of civilization existing in this area, you know, thousands of years ago. Um, the ancient Egyptians referred to a land called Punt, a land rich in gold and ivory. And uh, some people have speculated that Punt might have been located uh, in what is today uh, Somalia and Ethiopia. Um, now, the, the rulers of Aksum, they emerge as a great power around 300 AD. And Aksum is located right where the Red Sea flows into the Indian Ocean. And some people think that one of the reasons why this empire emerged is because these, uh, the rulers of Aksum learned how to, to control the traffic, control the trade that went through the Red Sea and out into the Indian Ocean. So uh, it's, there, it's probably not a coincidence that this empire developed around the exact same time that the Gupta Empire and the Byzantine Empire, late Roman Empire, were flourished, and that the Axum kind of was a go-between uh, in, uh, in a trade route that went through the Indian Ocean that linked India to the late Roman world. But uh, uh, Axum, they... Uh, they, they were, they, another thing about the civilization was that they were closely linked to South Arabia. So they were, uh, they were a mixed people. They were, they, were, they were black, but they were also Caucasian in the sense that they, they seem to have been, the, the, this empire came to include Southern Arabia, what is today Yemen. And, uh, and both of these areas were part of this empire. Now the ruler of Aksum by about 300 AD was claiming the title of emperor. And, it, and, and a ruler of many different people. So they, it's believed that control of this traffic, control of this trade, allowed them the resources to have the military force to control a very large area, stretching from the Sudan, through Ethiopia, through Somalia. So a big chunk of what is today Northeast Africa was ruled by this empire. Now what's interesting about Axum is that long before, well, about the same time as Constantine, 
So long before Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire under Theodosius, Christianity was embraced by the rulers of Axum around 300 AD. They became Christians. Uh, it's kind of interesting. Um, the Axum rulers, they would set up these stele. The, uh, you've heard about stele. You saw talking about Mayans, you know, these stone pillars where you write your achievements. And the rulers of, the rulers of uh, Axum, when they were pagan, when they conquered an area, they would set up a stele. And the stele would say something like, oh, I killed 50,000 people and I took their cattle and I slaughtered their cities and I thanked the war god this and the grain god this. They were polytheists, you know. But then, when they became Christian, it's kind of funny, they still set up stele, but they say, when I conquered these people, I showed them great mercy. And I blessed them. And I built them churches. And I converted them to the faith. You know, it's just like night and day. So they went from being, you know, like, I, gave, I sacrificed people to the war god to, oh, I built churches. And I was so merciful to them after I defeated them and took their taxes and their cattle. You know, so it was just kind of whole change in pace, change in tone. Now, interesting enough, they had to, uh, they had to develop, they wanted people to read the scriptures in their own language. And so they developed their own script called Ge'ez. And it's uh, very similar to... Uh, uh, Coptic, you know, the Egyptian, the Egyptian Coptic language was developed so that native Egyptians who did speak Greek could, could have their own alphabet, and, and it was borrowed heavily from Egyptian hieroglyphics. And uh, the, uh, the land of, of uh, Aksum included areas that had once been under Egyptian influence. So, so Ge'ez includes, it's a, a very strange mixture of scripts, and includes Greek letters as well as ancient Egyptian scripts, uh, hieroglyphics. But they created their own script so that they could translate the, the Bible into the language of the people. So it's called Ge'ez. And, uh, and, and uh, now eventually they became an Ophicite church. So they're, they're very similar to the, this church is very in, similar to the, the Coptic church in the sense that they're Monophysite Christians. Now, um, when, with the rise of Islam in the sixth century, what happened is that um, you know the, the Islam expanded into South Arabia, of course, and into Egypt. And this area, that the empire was destroyed, and by Arab uh, warfare with the Arabs, and eventually the rulers of Aksum retreated deep into the highlands of uh, Ethiopia, in the mountains of Ethiopia, and uh, their descendants continued to rule over parts of. Ethiopia all the way until the 20th century. In fact, the, uh, the ruler of Ethiopia in the 20th century, Haile Selassie, claimed to be descended from King David because the, the tradition was that the Queen of Sheba from South Arabia, when she went to visit Solomon, got pregnant and had a child uh, named Menelik, and that child was the ancestor of the rulers of Ethiopia. Just out of curiosity, Ethiopians have a totally compared to the other people surrounding them. I mean, what accounts for that? Well, there, there is, in, that, in Ethiopia, in that particular part of the world, and in Somalia as well, there is a very much a lot of intermarriage with Arabs from South Arabia. So there's, there's generations and generations, centuries of intermarriage between Arabs. So they are, a, you know, a, a, I don't know, a mixture of, of Caucasian and, and African uh, peoples. You know, that might explain, you know, the, the, the uniqueness. I think that they really do have a unique yeah. compared to everybody else. They're different. Yeah, they're they're different than let's say African people from other parts. You know, African appearance looking. That's, that's definitely true. Um, now, um, now the the Arab conquest of North Africa had a big di big impact on the rest of Africa as well. When because one of the things the Arabs introduced to large parts of Northern Africa was the camel. And the thing about the camel was that the camel made it possible for it to cross the Sahara Desert. So the arrival of Arabs also introduced the camel, which allowed for a lot more interaction between peoples in the north of Africa along the coast of Mediterranean coast with people in the savannah. And so uh, now, uh, and, and the uh, Muslim merchants made a real strong effort to uh, convert through persuasion and, and through trade, convert the peoples the south uh, to Islam. And in fact, Arabs referred to all of sub-Saharan Africa as the land of Sudan, which in Arabic means the land of the black people. 
But uh, so the Sudan originally was a term used by Arabs to describe all the area south of the Sahara Desert, inhabited by, by, by black people. Now, um, what happened though is that with more and more trade and interaction between the north coast of Africa and the savanna, the more interior part of Africa, there developed along the, especially along the Niger River, great centers of trade. Um, the, uh, the biggest commodities that were in demand by Arabs were in this order, gold, ivory, and slaves. Uh, so there was a lot of trade that linked the states in the, in the savanna, the, the, the cities there, with trade with the Arabs of North Africa. And, uh, so, uh, and, and so you see the rise of great cities like uh, Gao uh, and Timbuktu. Uh, Timbuktu today is in Mali, but it was uh, one of the great trading cities of Africa that traded uh, mainly gold and ivory and slaves with uh, the north. Um, now, over time, Islam was adopted by many peoples in Africa, but it, it really didn't have much of an influence further than the elites. So what we see happening in, in, in much of Africa, in the Sudan, and in, among African peoples is that uh, they, the, the elites, the tribal leaders, and the rulers would embrace Islam. They often would bring in Arabic uh, men of learning, Arab scholars, to be their ministers and advisors. So Arabs were often, uh, you know, uh, wealthy intellectual Arabs would often be recruited by African rulers to be their advisors and to give them advice on law, legal matters and, and, and writing law codes. Uh, but uh, among the masses, though, Islam did not really make much of an impact. So among the ma vast variety of peoples, they continued to worship their, uh, their ancestral religions, many of them focusing. Uh, most of them were polytheists. They worshiped many different gods and linked the forces of nature. They worshiped their ancestors. They worshiped the forces of nature. It's called animism, like believing that mountains and rocks and rivers and streams have spiritual forces behind them that need to be honored with sacrifices and prayer. Um, a lot of, uh, you ever heard of voodoo? Uh, a lot of voodoo worship that we see in, uh, in South America and Brazil and in the Caribbean well, incorporates a lot of African native worship, you know, this worship of spirits. Believing that spirits can bring you good luck now, or bring you fortune, or hurt you in the case of bad spirits. But uh, but the rulers of Africa tended to kind of be Muslim, but tolerate continued paganism among their peoples. And uh, but uh, but they adapted. And uh, one of the things, like for example, just giving um, give an example of how they adapted uh, in Africa, probably because it's so hot. Um, nudity was not a big deal. Uh, it was just it wasn't considered shameful. So so um, when Arab people, when Arabs from like Saudi Arabia would come to visit Muslims in Africa, they would show up in the city and they'd see all these women walking around topless, and they'd be like freaking out because you know how Arab women are covered from head to foot, you know. But but the Arab the, Muslim, the Africans would be like, well, what's your problem? And so what? Who cares? You know, they, they didn't have a problem with it. They weren't looking at it like. <laughs> you know, they're just like, yeah, it's, it's, it's hot. You know. She's topless, yeah, so what? You know, wasn't a big deal. Um, but, and they also, they adapted the, the architecture, the mosque, to their own culture. And this, I just want to show you this. Like, look at this. Uh, this, is a, this is the great mosque in Timbuktu. And it looks a lot different than other mosques, doesn't it? But it, what they did is they took the mosque idea and they adapted it to their local traditions of architecture and, and art. And you, you get this great cathedral, this great African cathedral, not cathedral, African mosque in, uh, in Timbuktu. All right. Now, um, what we see happening, though, is over the course of time, there emerged uh, a series of empires in uh, especially West Africa, uh, in the savanna. And uh, these empires, see, what happened is if, if you were a ruler, and you were able to control the major trade routes, you know, the gold, the ivory, the slaves, and control those trade routes, that in tax them, you would have enough resources to have a large army. And then, now the thing about West Africa is it's huge, and there's many different peoples live there. So keeping a large empire together 
with all these different peoples and over this vast distance, always involved keeping them, having a large army, having the resources to control the trade to have a large army, and then using that large army to impose taxes and tribute, and maintaining, and, and, and forcing local rulers, local chieftains, to um, submit to your authority and pay tribute. Now, one of the first of these empires was Ghana, uh, 990 to 1180. Ghana was one of the first great African empires in the savannah, and it encompassed much of what is today places like uh, Mali and Niger and, and those areas of, of West Africa. And uh, it, it, one of its greatest sources of wealth was its gold. And uh, there's a, when, when the, the ruler of Ghana made a pilgrimage to Mecca, um, the Arabs just couldn't believe because, I mean, he, he had gold everything. I mean, everything he had was gold. <laughs> Every, even the smallest article was made of pure gold. And they're like, see, man, I want to go to this place. These guys are loaded. You know? um, but you see, keeping an empire together was, was very difficult because of the distances and all the different diverse peoples. So you see a succession of empires after Ghana. Now one of the great successor empires to Ghana was the empire of Mali. The, na the modern nation of Mali is named uh, after the empire of Mali, which is much larger than the actual boundaries of Mali today. But Mali was an empire that stretched over much of West Africa in the savanna area. And, it, and its capital was Timbuktu. And its greatest ruler was uh, Mansa Musa. And uh, it, during his day, he made, uh, actually he made Timbuktu into one of the great Islamic centers of learning in all the world. He, he brought in scholars and uh, philosophy and, and science and all these great works and books and scholars. And, and uh, Timbuktu probably had more books in it in 1320 than Oxford University or Paris uh, combined. It was one of the great centers of learning. And uh, unfortunately, all these books, you know, one of these Al Qaeda people, you know, when they took over Timbuktu just not too long ago, they said, oh, these, these books are not permitted by Islam, so let's burn them. They were trying to destroy books, you know, because they weren't permitted by, 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 by Islam in their view. Even though Mansa Musa considered himself to be a great Muslim and a great Muslim ruler, you know, but uh, Al Qaeda, oh, we have to destroy these books and we destroy these monuments because they're, they're not, you know, they're not directly in the, in, the, in the Sharia law as we understand it. But anyway, <clears throat> now, so, uh, so now another area where we see a lot of uh, influence of, uh, of Arab culture was in, along the east coast of Africa, from, from uh, Somalia all the way down to Zanzibar and uh, Madagascar and uh, Mozambique, uh, the east coast of Africa along the Indian Ocean. And here is where you find what is sometimes called Swahili civilization, Swahili culture. Um, Swahili is a language, kind of like a language that is spoken by, it was originally spoken by traders and merchants, but it, it became the lingua franca, the common language spoken along the coast of East Africa. And Swahili is actually a mixture of Arabic and Bantu languages. Um, Bantu is the, the, one of the main language groups in Africa. It, it originated in Central Africa in what is today the, uh, um, the Democratic Republic of Congo in Central Africa. And it spread throughout to the south and to the east. And so from Central Africa all the way down to the tip of Africa, most people speak Bantu languages. Um, one of the advantages of Bantu speakers was that they had learned iron by the time of, about the time of Christ. They had learned how to create iron tools and weapons, and so that gave them an advantage over other peoples, and that's one reason why Bantus kind of spread and expanded across Africa. So, so today you find all kinds, there's literally hundreds of Bantu languages. They all, they're all share certain commonalities, but it's a, it's a, it's a common language group of, across Central and South Africa. Now in East Africa, the Bantu peoples who lived there, they were introduced to Islam through Arab merchants, and so they took the Arab language and adapted it to their own language and, cre and created Swahili. So, so uh, it, it's kind of funny because, you know, like uh, when they started Kwanzaa, I, I just think this is this kind of iron. Maybe you've heard of Kwanzaa. It comes from a, a Swahili language, right? And it was adopted by American, African Americans, right, in the 1960s, you know, to kind of be their, their holiday. But the thing about Swahili is that it's common in East Africa along the East Coast, but most American, African Americans come from West Africa, 
So they won't even have spoken Swahili. They won't even spoken most. They won't even speak in Bantu languages. I mean, some did, you know, but the vast bulk of American African Americans come from West Africa, where they don't they speak a totally different dialect. They don't even speak Bantu. So I don't know why they adopted Swahili for their Kwanzaa when when it's, it's just there's a disconnect there, you know. <laughs> Doesn't make sense to me. It bothers me as an historian, but anyway, I guess it's the idea of being African, quote unquote. Civilization, so it must be cool or something. But anyway, I don't know. But uh, but Swahili was in East Africa along the East Coast, and you see uh, the development of a whole, whole line of great cities like Zanzibar was one. Mogadishu, you've heard about Mogadishu now. You think of all the terrorists and the, all that, but Mogadishu in 1200 was one of the great cities in the world. It was a center of trade. That and along the coast of Africa, you'd find traders from. From China, from India, from uh, uh, from, from uh, the Mediterranean, all meeting together, and uh, there were great centers of trade. Now they, they came to be ruled by uh, independent rulers. Now by the time you get to the 1200, 1300, many of them adopted the title of Sultan because that was a, a common title used for kings. Now that the Celtic Turks had taken over, so a lot of times you hear about the Sultan of Mogadishu or the Sultan of Zanzibar. Now. Um, one of the things they did, one of the reasons why these cities flourished is because they acted as intermediaries between the interior of Africa and the coast. Uh, now, the interior of Africa was rich in gold. It still is, you know, especially South Africa. And a lot of these Swahili African merchants, they would, they, who were Muslim, they would, they would go up at like the Zambezi River in South Africa, in Mozambique, and they would have, intera- they had, they, they again, had interactions with the Shona peoples who lived there. Now, the Shona peoples were originally Bantu-speaking peoples who were pastoralists. You know, they, they raised cattle. And, uh, but through constant interaction with Swahili merchants, uh, they, they never adopted Islam, but they, they kind of developed into a very complex culture. And the Shona rulers began to build massive palaces and to establish strong states in what is today Zambia and Zimbabwe and, and South Africa. And... Uh, the term Zimbabwe it refers to these large stone palaces that were built. I mean, here you can see an example. Of it. These palaces are huge. There's like some of the rooms in these palaces have stone walls that are like 40 foot thick, and there and, and some of the central uh, uh, rooms in these palaces are as big as a football field. So these are massive structures. In fact, when when Europeans first saw them in the 19th century, when European explorers got into the interior of Africa, they, they assumed that the local African peoples could have never built such elaborate structures. They said, oh, the Phoenicians must have been here. But, but they were just massive. And, uh, but, the, but the Shona rulers, interesting thing about the Shona rulers was that uh, one reason why they built these massive palaces with these huge thick walls is because they were, uh, not only were they residential areas, but they were also temples. Because, like I said, the Shona people never embraced Islam. They they remain true to their ancient faith and their ancient polytheism. But they believed literally that their rulers were gods, and they worshiped the rulers. And this is the thing about being, you were talking about the history of the world, it's great to be king. It wasn't great to be a king of the Shona king, because if you were a Shona king and you got sick, they said, oh, false god, you have to be executed. <laughs> so, yeah, so, can you imagine a Shona king? No, I'm not sniffling. No, no, I'm not sick. No, I swear I'm healthy as a... I'm going to go run. You know, I'm great. I'm doing good. I think he's sniffling. I think he's sick. I don't think he's a god. I think we need to get rid of him and make his brother king. Because he's probably a real god. You know? But anyway. So it wasn't great to get shown to king. But they, were, they, wanted to re- they had all these elaborate rituals. And, and they built these big walls because they were all secret. And you had to be, in, and you had to be you know, uh, 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 in tight with the king and the royal family to, be, to participate in these sacred rituals that took place in the great palace, the great Zimbabwe of these Shona rulers. And these Shona rulers continued into 1500 to dominate uh, parts of uh, South Africa. Oh, well, we didn't get to Europe. But we will talk about uh, the Franks. We'll talk about uh, med- medieval Europe. And we're going to get to that on Wednesday. So I'll see you all on Wednesday.